Oh, oh, I haven't got that off. I've got a stinking headache though. Hello everybody, welcome to the Re-Review, the series where I get to replay and reassess games from my favourite gaming era. I'm Brian, also known as UKG and Zoidberg, and it's once again time to step away from my own personal reviews and into the wider world of Amiga games. This series is all about looking at how games reviewed back when they were released and seeing whether or not all those opinions are still relevant today. Each month I put out a vote asking our channel members to choose which game they want to see me cover next. And as it's the month of October, the choice this month was between two horror games. If you want to become a member and take part in next month's vote, there is a link to the offer below this video. The winner this month, and the game that I'm going to be replaying today, is Darkseed, which was developed and published by Cyber Dreams in early 1993. Cyber Dreams may have been a new name in gaming in 1992 when Darkseed arrived on the PC, but the people behind the name certainly weren't. It was founded in 1990 by Patrick Ketchum and Rolf Klug, with the aim of producing games in collaboration with some of the biggest names in fantasy, science fiction and horror. Prior to Cyber Dreams, Ketchum had spent the 1980s in charge of Datasoft, a company which he had founded in 1980 with a small team of just 15 programmers. They had produced games for the Apple II, Commodore 64 and various Atari systems, with their output consisting mainly of licensed titles such as The Goonies and Bruce Lee and a number of arcade conversions. As far as Amiga games were concerned, they were the North American publisher for Tech Software's Teramex, which was retitled Cosmic Relief for the US market. They also produced a number of text adventures and a strategy game based on the Tom Clancy novel The Hunt for Red October. At the end of the 80s, Ketchum spent a brief time working at Sullivan Bluth on the home computer versions of both Dragon's Lair and Space Ace. Shortly after setting up Cyber Dreams, they approached H.R. Geiger, the artist more well known for creating the Xenomorph in the Alien franchise, about providing artwork for a new game. Geiger only agreed if the developers would use high resolution graphics as he didn't like the 320 by 200 pixels that was the VGA standard at the time. After selecting the art that they were going to use for the game, it took the artist six months to add colour to the backgrounds, and then digitised actors were used for the characters that would populate the town. For the central character of Mike Dawson, the game's designer simply put himself into the game and even used his own name. The game sold well enough to warrant a 1995 sequel and was nominated for multiple awards. In October 2006, the now defunct Game Trailers website even placed it at number 7 on their list of the scariest games ever made. The games that it beat included Clock Tower, Eternal Darkness and System Shock 2. Their next game was the futuristic racing game Cyber Race, which featured vehicles from legendary Blade Runner artist Sid Mead. As well as the Dark Seed sequel in 1995, they also collaborated with author Harlan Ellison for the adventure game I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream. That game was a critical success, but a disappointing commercial flop. A proposed PlayStation version was cancelled as a result. After not being available for many years, it was picked up in 2013 by remaster specialists Night Dive Studios, and that led to the game being re-released on both GOG and Steam. Following a change in management at the company, Ketchum sold off his 50% stake and left to pursue a career as a photographer instead. Following his departure, Cyber Dreams would only release one more game, the poorly received Noir, a shadowy thriller, in 1997. Proposed collaborations with Dungeons & Dragons creator Gary Gygax and horror maestro Wes Craven were announced, and in some cases demos even shown, but the games were never finished or released. Two other games that Cyber Dreams had worked on, Blue Heat and Ares Rising, were completed and released by other studios. Now it's time to see what the magazines had to say about Darkseed when they reviewed it back in 1993. Six reviews of the Amiga version of Darkseed were published between February and March 1993, for an average score of 84%. Amiga Action had the game on the cover, and the one Amiga even gave away a pretty substantial playable demo on their cover disc. The highest score that it received was 95% from Ben Stiles at Amiga Computing, who was blown away by the game's art and story. 
His only issue with the game was the use of high-res graphics, which meant that it flickered on some displays and consequently made a lot of the text hard to read. The lowest score that it received was 72% from Amiga Format. Neil Jackson was also impressed with the visuals, but criticised the time-reliant gameplay and confusing way that the plot unfolds. He did, however, still recommend it if you were a horror fan. For the CD32 release in 1994, the game was reviewed again by most magazines. This time, from five reviews, the average was just 75%. Amiga Power gave it 63%, which was quite a drop from their original 88% that they had given it first time around. Reviewer Jonathan Nash stated that it was a good attempt at making something different, but that the gameplay was overly picky, punishing you for solving puzzles on the incorrect day in some cases, and that the overall adventure itself was too linear. Even Amiga Computing lowered their incredibly enthusiastic score from the original review to just 70%, saying that there was just too much slow plodding around from one location to another. Now I'm going to play the game again for myself and see how it stacks up today. It's time for the playtest. Okay, I am actually playing the CD32 version here, so uh, this should be fully voiced. That sure was some nightmare. It even left me with a monster headache. So the downside to playing with the CD32 version is that I have to control the pointer with a joypad rather than a mouse. So first thing you have to do is clear the character's headache, which is done by uh, getting the pills from the bathroom cabinet. I do like the um, the interface that this game has because you have a choice between a you have a choice between an, an arrow, a hand, or a question mark, and when you move over specific items, that will change to let you know that you can interact with it. So that question mark changes to an exclamation mark. Old trench coat. I wouldn't be caught dead in that thing. Don't know if it's uh, vanity or laziness that um, led the, uh, the game designer to put himself in the game. It was, uh, designer Mike Dawson is even the guy is even who voices character here as well. I think it's the room on the left that I need to go to here. So that shows that there is a secret room off to off the side of the study. So I am in the study, so that must mean I need to push this wall here. Character character movement could definitely be uh, quicker than it is, I think. Let's push the chest out of the way because I think there's something under it. I don't see why you have to push the chest three times to get it out of the way. It's, uh, I suppose, in the same way that um, I had to investigate the coat three times in order to find the uh, the library ticket what in the pocket. What a tremendous view of the town from up here! But the wooden railing looks as though it has seen better days. Oh, if you're playing this on the Amiga 500, you can either press the T key or on the CD32 press the left left button on the controller, and that advances time a little bit. I just advanced time because I knew that the postman would be coming. Gives me a creep, creepy baby doll. There is definitely a uh, very creepy atmosphere that the game manages, manages to create. Out here. My house seems somehow out of time. A relic of a dark past, or perhaps a dark future. Although it must be said that this piece of music that's playing now doesn't really uh, fit with the atmosphere of the rest of it. I think the next thing that I'm waiting for is the phone to start ringing in the house. But I'm not exactly sure what time that happens. I don't think there's anything particularly um, brain taxing by about any of the puzzles in this game. It's all, all a lot of busy work. There's never, there's never any, uh, any moment where you feel clever for having solved something. Let's have a look at the Geiger painting on the wall, shall we? A masterpiece of the macabre. Its eyes follow me relentlessly. Oh, no, I don't even need to wait. The phone is ringing now. Let's go and get it. Hello? Hello, Mike. This is Sue at the library. We have a book on hold for you, so please stop by sometime. Right, so let's head to the library then. As good as all the background art is on this game, it really is a shame that they didn't 
take the opportunity on the A1200 version to add more colour to it. Right, so let's give the library ticket to the librarian. Which one's the library ticket? This card really should be kept with the book. You'll find that one in aisle C. It's the one with the green cover. The one with the green cover. You mean to tell me there's only one book with the green cover in aisle C? Sure is quiet here. You could it's a pin drop. It's a library, of course it is. The rows of books in the library stacks all look pretty much the same. No, oh, there's two books with a green. I mean, why does he walk so slowly on this screen? I just don't get it. I think this game came out at a time when um, adventure gaming was at its peak, and I was really starting to get into it. Uh, um, obviously, I just had Monkey Island 2 and Police Quest, so I do remember. I do remember that I bought this game as soon as it came out, and uh, I did get a little bit frustrated with the fact that. Um, I kept having to restart the game due to errors that I'd made. Uh, one error in particular I remember actually uh, required me to restart the game all the way from the beginning because the save game wasn't good enough. I think this might be the last thing that I have to do on day one. The, day I, the game actually takes place over the course of three days. So I think using the key on the clock is the last thing that I have to do today. Just remember that name to John McKeegan. Unfortunately, there is no way to carry on with the game from here without going to sleep first, because you can't travel over to the Dark World without getting the item the postman delivers the next morning. It is now 8pm on day one. I wonder if it will let me go to bed. And another nightmare. To press time pass twice for the postman to arrive. Here we go. Found this broken shard from the mirror. There we go. So if I reattach that to the mirror, I'll be able to transfer myself to the dark world. An unnatural glow emanates from the chamber. Strange machines provide energy, nourishing the creatures cocooned in their sacks. So every room in the real world is replicated in the dark world. These look like the plans for a gruesome biological experiment on a human. Hmm, yes, I wonder who that human is. That's the gloves, okay. And then use this lever over here with the gloves. I will die from being electrocuted if I don't wear the gloves. This is the outside of the alien edifice. It reminds me somewhat of the front of my own house. I don't see how it looks completely different. See, now this is what I said about earlier about the number of colours meaning that items are not visible. Somewhere in this room, there is a shovel that you can pick up. Would you like to guess where it is? Yes, it's here. So I now want to take that shovel that I've just picked up and head to the cemetery in the real world and dig up the grave of Mr. Uh, Mr. McKeegan. I mean, I, I can definitely see why um, reviews raved about this game so much when it was originally released. Um, but I can also see that it doesn't seem to have aged particularly well. With the number of games that came out around this time that have received remakes in recent years, it would be interesting if this game got one. Now, I knew I knew exactly which grave I was heading for there. It's another diary page. Let's have a read. Now, a lot, a lot of these gravestones are actually uh, a couple of little in jokes. G. Threepwood, rest in peace. See, G. Threepwood, R.I.P. Come here, Dawson. I want a word with you. So, you know, unfortunately, last time I checked, digging up a grave wasn't entirely legal. You're under arrest, Mr. Dawson. Come with me. So uh, this is where I find myself thrown in a jail cell, and that's probably a good, as good a place as any to uh, end the playtest. Let's just say that the um, get out of jail free card that you got earlier comes into play here. Um, so let's move on to uh, the summary, 
and uh, I'll give it my overall thoughts and uh, give the game a score. I still find that there's a lot to admire in Darkseed. The presentation does a great job of creating an atmosphere of unease, and getting H.R. Geiger to provide the artwork was a masterstroke. It's a shame that for the AGA version they didn't utilise the larger colour palette, as it can occasionally be difficult to see some of the items on screen. The control interface is also incredibly easy to use, whether you're playing with a mouse on the A500 or a joypad on the CD32. However, I'm not a fan of the constantly ticking clock, as there are many occasions where you can simply stand around waiting for something to happen. Also, you can easily miss critical events, the problem there being that you have no idea that you've missed them and that it's now rendered the game unbeatable. I get that this was a way to add replayability to the game, which is something missing from the, the majority of games in the adventure genre. It gives you things that you can discover on a second playthrough, but having to restart from the beginning is annoying, especially when you can't skip any of the animation sequences that you've already seen. Worse still, there are no Eureka moments at all in the adventure. Almost all of the items are used exactly where you would expect them to use. Would it have killed the designers to label one of the keys in the game as a small key rather than a clock key, as there is actually only one clock in the game, so it's pretty obvious where you have to use it. Horror is not a particularly well served genre on the Amiga, and Darkseed does sit quite high in the Mini Super League. However, I would recommend that you check out the games that are above it before you play this one. Ultimately, I think even though it can be annoying at times, there's enough that's good about it to make it worth playing. And that's why I'm going to give it 7 out of 10. Thank you for watching this episode of the Re-Review. I really hope you enjoyed it. Everything that I've said in this video is purely my own opinion and not that of the UK Gaming Network team. I'd love to know what your memories of Darkseed are and whether or not you agree with my assessment. Please let me know in the comments. If you're new to the channel and this is your first episode in the series, I will put a link to the playlist of all previous episodes on screen, which should be there right about now, and I'll also put a link to the Retro Game Super League's playlist up there with it. If you want to take part in selecting November's game, please do consider becoming a VIP member. It costs just $1.99 a month, and in addition to being able to take part in the vote, you'll also get to see a number of our videos earlier than anyone else, as well as get access to a lot of exclusive content. Even if you don't want to become a member though, we do appreciate you watching. Until next time, happy retro gaming, bye for now.